they did the same thing on the east side of the mountain that they had done on the west side of the mountain. They, they installed the so-called South Canaan Loop, uh, which then took these steam locomotives, conventional steam locomotives with, you know, 20, 30 conventional rail cars filled with coal down the ridge lines going towards South Canaan, swinging around, coming back into uh, the Lake Lador Amusement Park, which is an another big attraction on the line, into Waymart, and then, the, then, these, then these coal cars went right into, um, into Honesdale. And by that point, uh, the uh, Erie Railroad and, and others were, were taking coal shipments out of Honesdale. So they did, uh, and the canal was closed in, 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 in 99, so they didn't have to reload the coal, but they were then taking these, these coal cars uh, by means of the Erie Railroad and also the DNH uh, from there to everywhere, everywhere in America. So they had both of these, uh, both of the, on both sides of the mountain, they had this, uh, they had uh, astonishing rail lines. If you go up there today, you, to try and try and um, sort out the rail lines, or the remains of rail lines that you see on top of that mountain is not an easy thing because there was the, the 1829 configuration. It was revised in 1841-43. It was revised in 1858. There were revisions in 1868. And all the rail beds are there. And if you know about uh, rail lines and stuff, railroad beds have a way of not going away. They're just sort of there. You can sort of, you can sort of see that a rail line went through that up there. But you know, what exactly am I looking at? You know, and then the, but the new rail line may go this way. You know, so this, that mountain is covered with rail line vestiges of earlier, or earlier rail lines. So it's, it makes it a little bit difficult to, uh, to, um, to do genealogy, not genealogy, but do to do engineering research on that mountain because of the of the great number of of uh, rail lines. You can go up there today and find pretty much the sites of many of the stationary steam engines. As I say, they were, the they were stationary engines at the top of the planes, and there was the cables came from this, from the engine houses, which pulled these cars up, up, the, um, up, the, uh, up the inclined planes. One of the astonishing people that they had involved in the, in, in the operation of this line very early was uh, John Roebling, who uh, invented the wire cable, the wire rope, um, which uh, was used in the aqueducts constructed by the, by the DNH over various rivers between here and the Hudson River. And using this same wire rope, um, the, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Bridge was built. Brooklyn Bridge, which was also built by Roebling, uh, would not have been not have been possible without the uh, without the uh, innovative work done on the DNH railroad here. But this this wire rope is essentially like a like a conventional hemp rope that one might find in in an average sort of 19th century barn to sort of move hay around or something. You know, a very thick hemp rope, except it's it's uh, strands of metal metal wire and then the wire enclosed in various casings and so on to strengthen it. But that, is, uh, that was used by the, um, by, the, uh, by the DNH folks to make, these, uh, to make these aqueducts, the one of which is still standing in a beautiful condition, the Lackawaxen Aqueduct over at, um, at, across the Delaware um, in Lackawaxen. And uh, you can, you can uh, walk over that these days and there it is, this monument to John Roebling. And you go over there and look at that bridge, it just blow you away to think this, this was done in the middle of the 19th century. And there it is now, just as strong as it was when completed. That's the one that's called the Roebling Bridge. The Roebling Bridge, yes. Yeah. And what they had, the, what, why they built that, why they built that aqueduct, <coughs> essentially then what, what the canal did is the canal went over this bridge. I mean, it was not, it was not a rail bridge, it was the, the canal itself went across this bridge. And they did that for at least two reasons. One was the, um, with all the logging operations in the Delaware River, there was a lot of, there were a lot of problems caused by conflicts between loggers and canal people. The, the loggers were just sending these great huge log rafts down the, down the Delaware River, and the canal boats were, were, had to cross the river at that point. 
because initially when the canal first opened, the canal there at Lackawaxen, leaving Honesdale, got to Lackawaxen, came out to the edge of the Delaware River. And what they did is, at that point was essentially is with these loaded canal boats, sort of shoot across the river and then pick up the canal on the other side. So they so they, so they 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 had they they and they took the mules and things across on 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 rope ferries and stuff. But the canal boats they got to the edge of the Hudson River and sort of out into the river and then down the river a little bit. You know, they then got the boat back into a into a into a, another basin and got it back into the canal system on the other side of the river. Well, that, as you can imagine, was a source of endless headaches because of high water and low water and, and, and these logging problems and so on. So they had huge problems associated with getting across the Delaware River. So at that point, um, they decided to put this, put the canal above the river. And so you have this magnificent rolling aqueduct over there, which is still there today. And so the canal itself got to the edge of the of Delaware River and continued right across the top of the Delaware River. And um, they, this happened in the middle middle of the 19th century and operated with, with great success until the uh, until the canal closed in uh, in in 99 1899. And that too was revised several times in the course of the of the 19th century. It was it was. I, the numbers don't come to mind immediately, but when it first opened, it was four feet deep, and then it was five feet deep and 20 feet wide, and they kept making it bigger so they could get bigger boats with greater tonnage and get more coal to market. Those numbers are all very available on how, on how deep it was and how wide it was. Yes, sir? Well, they, they use it now right for single one-lane uh, to drive your car over now. Yes, you, yeah. I, 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 do they still allow it? Yeah, I was up there over? last year. But the, uh, there were a lot of problems with it. The Park Service now has it, and they were, they, they've restructured and, and strengthened and so on. But the, uh, but you can drive across it, or you can walk across, essentially through the uh, where, where the mules walked uh, uh, these days. You can walk walk across the top of this um, top of this astonishing rolling aqueduct. There is so much to be said on, on that canal. The canal cost six million dollars to build in 1828. Now somebody, somebody must, Dale must have the answer to this. How much six million dollars in 1828 would be today? I mean, there's a, I'm sure there are charts somewhere that can hurt this for you, you know. And Dale will be the person to find that chart. But the, um, but the canal cost six million dollars to build. That's a lot of bananas. And the railroad cost three million dollars to build. So there's nine million dollar expenditure on the part of the DNH in the 1820s. The generation of my grandparents in the 1880s, to get a sense of a sense of money, the uh, my grandparents decided to get married when my grandfather was making a dollar a day. He's making a dollar a day. We can we can make this work. So in the 1880s. When he was making a dollar a day, they got married. So this was, you know, 1880s. So or my great grandparents. So so think about what nine million dollars must have been like in 1828. <laughs> if if a dollar a day was was a very respectable wage. Nine billion. Oh, I bet you know in, in the 1880s. I mean, it was just un unbelievable uh, investment in the. Um, in this engineering engineering feat, the uh, the railroad and the canal, they're, they're, it just it is on. There's so many aspects of it that are that are that are interesting and in in uh, uh, that have not really been explored in great detail. In one of these uh, monthly talks that go on in Carbondale on the on this railroad, focused only on on uh, horses and mules, and the canal and the railroad. And uh, there's so much to be said and so much to be reported on, on the role of, the, of horses and mules uh, in, this, in this system. Not only the mules pulling the canal boats, but the horses and the mules in the mines and the horses and the mules and the operation of the rail lines in the Lackawanna Valley. And uh, that's a very interesting, interesting uh, topic to uh, explore in great detail.
Another very interesting topic is the, as I said earlier, the uh, extension of the line, the gravity line down the valley, as we say, uh, to Archibald in 1841-43, and then to Oliphant in in the in the, in the 50s. But the um, but and then to Providence by 1860. In 1858, you get as far as as uh, Oliphant uh, by the gravity. The end of the gravity system was in Oliphant, and then from 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 Oliphant to Providence. There was a there was a, a, a level a steam line with this very rudimentary steam locomotives, which you then got off the gravity car and went on a with a steam locomotive from Oliphant to Providence. At which point, if you're going into Scranton further, you then got on a a, 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 a street railway pulled by a horse as well, so that the uh, this the extension of the line down the valley is a very interesting and complicated topic too. I recently was on uh, foot trying to sort some of this stuff out in Providence and there are lots of DNH buildings still in Providence uh, that one can, that it's amazing is still there. And one is the, uh, on, on Depot Street in, uh, in, in Providence is that beautiful d &H office building, which these guys know about because they're shaking their heads in the right way. <laughs> but I, 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 I looked and looked and looked to find out exactly what that beautiful building um, uh, was. I knew it was not, I knew it was a fancy building right there by the railroad tracks. It had to be somehow connected with the d &H. Finally, in a deed book for the, um, the we, we bought a couple of 19th century d &H deed books and uh, they were doing some kind of repair and there was a sketch of that Depot Street area where the buildings were all identified and there it was that on that, in that plot, just on the northwest corner of, of, of Depot Street and the railroad tracks, d &H office, it says on them. And I, I, I wanted to see that in print and uh, there, there it was in one of those mid-century uh, deed books across the street from that was where the, where the depot was, and the freight stations in Providence are still there. But the DNH and the DL and W, of course, were, were at each other's throats vehemently uh, at the time because the DL and W said, no, you are not coming into Scranton. And they stopped them dead at the, at the, at the Providence line, and the, the, and the, the DNH finally finagled their way, their way around, around it primarily through the astonishingly creative and innovative footwork of Thomas Dixon, Dixon City man, Thomas Dixon, uh, to get, in, get into Scranton and then by these, these unbelievable uh, rail negotiations and, and boardroom mergers and deals and so on, the DNH got itself uh, uh, into Scranton and uh, then to Wilkes-Barre and, uh, and then and farther south. But the, um, the, um, the, the, that has never really been investigated in great detail. And I, and I think uh, I had another one of these monthly talks only on this valley road down, down to Providence. And, and in the course of doing the research for that, I learned a lot about what happened down here, which never has been, nobody's ever written about that. They just said, oh yes, to Providence by 1860, and then, you know, the world by 1880. But nobody ever really sort of goes into detail. <coughs> and um, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting tale to tell what's, what, what happened in the, uh, down here. The Van Storch Breaker, um, Van Storch Breaker, which is, if you're in the Green Ridge Shopping Center, <coughs> and you look, uh, west, you see uh, a, a, the remains of a breaker at the top of which now it says Dreeter Coal Company, but also that that was the Von Storch breaker, and oh the finagling they went through to get get a sort of get a toehold in, in Providence, and then they got the rights to ship their coal through Providence, and and, and then it, they kept sort of inching their way forward until finally. They had a they had a, a connection into Scranton with the, the, all the, these railroad deals that were, were just a, they're enough to sort of curl your hair at some of the things they did and, and they but they they managed to get themselves um, to Wilkes-Barre and the immense coal reserves in, in the Wilkes-Barre area, all of which were brought up 
through the through this system up through the Lackawanna and then um, into into Carbondale over the mountain. It's quite an experience to go like you know 100 miles from here over way over in the in the in the remote regions uh, you know High Falls New York and over in that way towards the Hudson River and 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 to come across this ditch through the woods that's no wider than from here to that wall not even that wide and to realize that the hundreds of millions of tons of coal out of this valley all passed right there in front of you through this through this complicated um, rail system that um, that went out of the, went out of the Lackawanna Valley. One of the very interesting things about this this, uh, this 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 anthracite coal and these rail lines and and the, and the canal lines out of the Lackawanna Valley is in this in this Lackawanna Valley. It was it was the first sort of industrial valley. In America, nobody preceded it. This is in the 1820s. What was going on here in the Lackawanna Valley was seminal to what was going to happen in America in the next couple hundred years, because the whole economy before that, people were everybody lived on a farm. Everybody lived in, the, in these sort of rural situations and so on. There was there was not really a sort of industrial thing going on in America. Philadelphia to a certain extent, New York to a certain extent, but nothing quite as unified as this, what went on in this Lackawanna Valley from, you know, from, from Simpson to Natticoke. And uh, what happened in this valley is, uh, is unbelievable. Not only technologically, but also sociologically, and also, well, that, that's, that you're all interested in, in genealogy, and we all worship at the Joe Breyer altar, you know, with his, with his genealogical research. But people from all over the world came to this Lackawanna Valley, and uh, and that's 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 one of the things which makes it uh, so interesting. And there's so many so many misconceptions out there about life in the Lackawanna Valley in the 19th century. Granted, life was tough. Life was hard. But the people who came here, from everywhere they came, life was good. They were successes. They saw themselves as leading successful lives. They saw themselves on an upward path. They didn't have two nickels to rub together, but their children had four. And their children had eight. Life was, it was they were on an up, upward ascent. And one of the things which is, uh, which is galling is the fact that the, most of the 19th century uh, writing on the valley, uh, people seem to assume that, oh yes, everyone lived in a, you know, a tar paper shack by the side of the road and blah, blah, blah. You know, life was tough. A lot of, we know, we, the, the so-called modern conveniences that we all seem to think are necessary these days were not, didn't exist. But they all, life was, life was in an upward path. They were successes. They built communities. They built all these wonderful churches and all these civic and fraternal organizations. They all learned English. They all knew what a bar of soap was and how to use it. They all built communities. They all had, life was good. Life was better here than wherever they were coming from with no work at all. And uh, I'm not sticking my head in the sand and saying there were not, there were not lots of difficulties and a lot of rough times and lots of things to be overcome, but they, their lives were successful, they saw themselves as successful, and life was good. But we tend to have it stuffed on our throats by the standard histories that, oh, oh, the, oh the poor folks, and, and they, you know, they shivered from November till March and had, you know, two chicken legs to eat all winter, you know. Granted, there were good years and bad, but for the most part, life was on an upward, upward, <coughs> upward path, and life was good, and and the vestiges of all that are are everywhere. All these family values and community values and things that most of us grew up with, and most of which are going or virtually gone from community lives, were very much a part of daily life for most of these people who lived who led very enriched, full, gratifying lives. And that, 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 that is just, that's been sort of swept under the carpet by, by most sort of 
approaches to 19th century history. And it, it, that's not the case. There's, you just have to look at some of these 19th century newspapers, which are filled with articles about <coughs> church, community, civic, family things that are very positive and lots of, lots of very successful stuff going on. It's amazing um, how, how matter-of-fact they were about mine accidents and rail accidents and life and death. You know, it was just one went to work thinking, well, maybe I'm not going to come back alive, but life goes on. And that happened too many tens of thousands of times, probably. Lots of people were killed, but, you know, life goes on, life is good, here we are. And it's great to be in America where these things are possible. That sort of, that is very much a part of, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of the, of the social history associated um, with these rail lines and with these coal mines. Disaster after disaster after, dis after disaster, but, you know, pick up the pieces and keep going. And they did that. And um, it's interesting that we have in Carbondale a sign about this big, a metal sign, which says, uh, in, I think it's five or six languages, I know it's five or six languages, if you're involved in an accident, please report to your supervisor at once, or something like that. But it's in it's in English, Welsh, Slovenian, Czechoslovakian, Hungarian. I don't know whether the, what the five or six languages off the top of my head are, but there they all are. This was this was a sign that was posted in this this you know there were there were, these signs like this were everywhere for for this um, uh, astonishing community from all over the world. You look at the, um, and it's interesting to look at it from that sociological perspective. Uh, now, Dale, with all his cemetery work, you sort of see these things where, you know, suddenly there are all kinds of, lots of deaths from, uh, you know, from like the, 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 the epidemics and the, the, the spotted fever and the black fever from the 1850s and 60s and all these, all these sorts of things. And you, 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 you can follow patterns of, 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 of disease and, and age of, of death, but you also follow patterns of immigration, where suddenly you're seeing all these uh, all these uh, German names, and then you're seeing lots of of uh, English names, people identifying themselves as being English or Cornish, or or being uh, you know then the the mid-century Irish immigrations, and then lots of Northern Europeans, and uh, then Central Europeans, and. Uh, of huge immigrations of people from uh, Hungarians coming in the in the 70s and the 80s. So to see these patterns of immigration and patterns of names, and I think you see this. I'm sure Joe sees this and, and the rest of the group in uh, in genealogical research, where you see you see, you can you can judge who was who was arriving when and who was dying when by the by the ethnicity of, of the names. In the 1870s, there were huge labor problems in the uh, in the Lackawanna Valley, and um, 1873, 77 was the strike. But in the 18, early 1870s, um, lots of labor labor problems began, and the mines were closed for three months at a time, two months at a time. Here, the railroads were closed. Nobody, you know, there, there was lots of sort of negotiations back and forth. Lots of Lots of uh, uh, sensitive feelings right there on the surface. And uh, in reading the newspapers from the 1870s, I try to sort of keep as many ears open as possible and eyes open as I read. Um, I, I, I suddenly was aware um, of all the references I kept coming across to huckleberries. And I thought, all this huckleberry business, what is all this huckleberry stuff about? Now, as I think many of you know, or most of you know, huckleberries are, are delicious. I mean, they make the so-called current blueberries look ridiculous when you talk about huckleberries. I mean, they're, they're smaller and more flavorful. Now you buy huckleberries or blueberries, whatever they might call them in the store. They're the size of large marbles, and they're pretty, but they're sort of largely tasteless. But the uh, big and puffy and not like much flavor. Like strawberries. Strawberries don't taste like they're pretty and red, but that's about it, you know. But, but the, uh, the huckleberries are are smaller and much more more flavorful. And um, 
one of the uh, sort of not silly, but it started out in my mind thinking it was sort of a silly sort of sidebar thing was I was I announced I was going to talk about huckleberries in Carbondale, one of these Thursday night things. And it, believe it or not, there were a couple of fruit merchants in Carbondale who were who would the statistics shipped over the DNH. They would like on Tuesday so and so sent 55 bushels of huckleberries to Binghamton on, on the morning train, this kind of stuff. So and so spent sent 150 bushels on Thursday. You can't imagine the number of huckleberries that were out of the Lackawanna Valley in the in the 1870s. And the point, the interesting point was, the whole family went huckleberry. The mines were closed. The railroads were not operating. Everybody went huckleberry, and huckleberries essentially fill the bill. I mean, you, you could make a decent daily wage by picking huckleberries from the middle of, you know, end of June till the early August or whatever it was. And uh, the statistics on, on, on the amount of shipping of huckleberries over the, over the local railroads is very amusing and interesting. When you put them all together, I bet I have 50 articles from newspapers <coughs> giving statistics on the amount of huckleberries sent out of Carbondale, Mayfield, Jessup, not Jessup, uh, Carbondale, uh, Blakely, yeah, that, that, that was the primary reference for those Carbondale papers, but the uh, but hundreds and hundreds of bushels of, 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 of huckleberries being sent out per day, by means of which one could make a, a few dollars, you know, they, they were selling it for 10 cents a quart, but might make a few dollars to sort of, you know, keep body and soul together. And part of one of the very wonderful kinds of articles I come across that I find very interesting are when someone uh, they're talking about I don't know labor problems and strikes, and then people say, "Well, as long as we have a cow and a place to grow vegetables, we're okay." You know? And that's really very. I mean, that's the way I I was raised in that world, and that, that means a lot. I I, I, re I relate immediately to that sort of those kinds of. Uh, those, that kind of approach to the world. I mean, if you have a cow in a garden, what else do you need? I mean, you could you could make it. But the uh, but the, that that's just one of, of dozens and dozens of sort of side things which make this 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 history of this of this DNH rail line um, so interesting because it, and it's all part of this same Lackawanna <coughs> Valley thing, and. Um, that's why it's uh, a lot of it. A lot of it has never been really reported. A lot of it is a lot of it is there to be discovered, but a lot of it has not been re been reported. And that's what I'm trying to gather a lot of this, tons of this stuff in this um, in this in this book I'm working on. In addition to the uh, in addition to the to the basic technological things about the functioning of the railroad, which are which is just unbelievable. The breakers and and. and <clears throat> There was one breaker in the Carbondale yard, the Lackawanna breaker, where 800 people worked in one breaker. Can you imagine that? I can't even. I just can't even imagine that. 500 people in Carbondale worked at, at, at uh, Farview and on Shepherd's Crook. The six o'clock train bearing the 500 workers from Farview and Shepherd's Crook arrived at the Salem Avenue, the Lincoln Avenue station, an hour later. You know. Those kinds of numbers just just don't they just they just they're hard to put together in our in our current perspective on on the world. But tens and th tens of thousands. Yes, sir. Can you touch a little bit on the Underwood? On the Underwood, yes. The uh, Underwood was established in um, in uh, in 1912 by uh, F. D. Underwood, who was the uh, who was a an official of of. Um, of the Erie Railroad, and he came here. He came and visited the um, came and visited this 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 model uh, town called Underwood, which was located just up here above, up behind what's the name of the school? Valley Mid Valley or up on the, what's yeah, the, Mid Valley? Yeah. Up beyond Mid Valley School, and uh, his name was F. D. Underwood, and um, the town was established in 1912. It closed in uh, in 1936. It closed for three reasons. Um, the first reason, uh, it, by 1930, the companies realized it was no longer too necessary to have key personnel living right at your mine operation because the automobile made it possible to live farther away 
so they, they, uh, there was no need to have these people living right there at the, at the colliery. And so that, that, uh, that caused people to move uh, away from collieries and, and therefore that was no longer necessary to maintain the town. That was the one reason. The second reason was they had a growing need for a refuse dump and a silt bank, which was, uh, which was they needed the extra space to do it, the space for it, for, the, for those mines. And the third reason was they wanted to undermine the village because there was a huge quantity of coal under Underwood, which they, <coughs> they uh, didn't want to access without uh, moving the people out of there. And so the Pittston Coal Company um, um, announced in 1936 that they were going to close the, um, um, close the community. The community was located both in the boroughs of Troop and, uh, and Oliver. Are they both boroughs? Are they in Oliver yeah. and Troop? And um, in the in the um, in the um, in the um, mo this model community, there were there were the number off my head. I think 48, 48 houses. And um, because I have a map here. There were, there were eight houses which belonged to the mining officials, and there were 28 houses, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the minor, the officials' houses were these eight houses on the bottom here that were located in the borough of Troop. And then there was a main street up through the other section of town where there were, where there were 28 houses which were located in the borough of Oliphant. And in 1981, I spoke to my father specifically on this question, and he identified the occupants of houses one through eight. I, I'm astonished by my father's memory of doing this as an older man. It, uh, houses number one, the, the family's names were Leitner, he was the mine foreman, Beecham, colliery superintendent, Elvidge, mine foreman, Cordy, the mine foreman, Wrightson, mine foreman, Dick, William Dick, plumbing engineer, Silas Powell, my grandfather, electrical engineer, and Hugh Walker was the outside foreman living in those in those in those eight houses, those, those eight <coughs> official houses, which were steam heated uh, by the by the power plant at the at the at the at the colliery, and the houses they were they, those were single family houses, and um, then there were the houses where the miners lived, and uh, off the top of his off of his head. My father went through the names Shotton, Newman, Burns, Fitzsimmons, Bowden, Travis, Sheridan, McCone, Browning, Balderson, May, Bowden, Lake, Washeen, Judd, Shoemaker, Walker, Bowden, Atkinson, Harris, Hulse, Hulse, H-U-L-S-E, Webb, Logan, Elvidge, Burns, Coates, Sharples, Moretti, Coates, Basiliga, Balderson, Sherrick, Krista, Mason, and Wagner. He couldn't remember two or three of the other occupants of these houses, but he went up one side of the street and down the other in his mind. I, 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 I thought, go, Dad, go. It was really, you know, I mean, that was, that was, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Scranton Republican in 1936, when they closed the, um, the village, there was an article uh, uh, titled, you know, Sadness hangs over Underwood as death knell rings for last company village. And here we have the pictures of the houses, the, the, uh, the houses of those, of the, of the so-called officials. And my father said that the, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the breaker was to the right over, over beyond in that direction, he recalled at that time. Um, pictures of, of, of the community house. And then I found another article in the uh, Scranton Republican, also in July of 1936, um, about, about Underwood, where there's lots of very interesting uh, stuff, recollections by, by, uh, by um, various people. A, a, a woman by the name of Barbara Robleski, who used to write for the Mid Valley News, told me that in, um, she told me in 1985 that uh, George Hyduck, H-Y-D-U-K, who lived on, who lives, or lived on East Spruce Street in Elephant, has done many oil paintings of Underwood. 
Um, life in this wooded section began in 1912 when the Pennsylvania Coal Company built the first model coal colony around the clearing in the valley at the foot of the Music Mountain. Part of the village was an elephant, part in troop. The dividing line, line ran right down the center of the main street. And the miners and their families resided in elephant while the officials lived in troop. On Sundays, the schoolhouse became a church, and visiting preachers would, would deliver the sermon to the older people while a few towns taught Sunday school for the children. There were no stores in the village. You had to come into Oliphant or into Troop. F.D. Underwood, then president of the Erie Railroad, visited there shortly after its completion. They, um, they then renamed the village after him. There were 250 hand-picked residents who lived in the village. There were no merchants, bakers, butchers, or candlestick makers. Supplies had to be purchased in either Troop or Oliphant for the convenience of the female portion of the community. A bus ran between Underwood and Troop, meeting the car line in Troop, and proceeding into Scranton. No doctor, no nurses. In the center of the town, two bathhouses were built for the, um, for the miners and their, and their families. The first up-to-date wash house ever built for a mining town. All houses were electrically lighted from the electric plant from the colliery. Houses heated by the company's steam plant. There were, um, there were six houses in, with steam heat from the mines, water, toilets, and electricity. The rent was $15 a month. Later it was raised to 25. Two rows of houses, this is my father speaking, two rows of, two rows of 10 houses that had no toilets, just hot and cold water, no heat. There was a bathhouse for the people who lived in the two rows of ten houses. Those people didn't take care of the bathhouse, and the bathhouse was closed, and they had to take baths in the kitchen, said he. Um, they never had any labor problems there because there was such a close relationship between the officials and the, and the, and the miners. The five superintendents of the colliery in its entire history were were E. C. Weichel, W. E. I. C. H. E. L., William Jeffrey, Fred Beecham, Court Snyder, Arthur.